Uh, so hi everyone. I'm very happy to join you today at this uh, implementation working group. My name is Anavina Mutabas. I'm the programs coordinator for policy. I um, I work at, as a programs coordinator for advocacy and feminist movement building. As Darren uh, earlier introduced, policy uh, is a combination of data scientists, technologists, academicians, and researchers all working at the intersection of data for the purpose and focus on ensuring that there is appropriate and effective data use. We also focus our projects on ensuring that more African women are involved, especially when it comes to issues of data, data governance, and informed decisions. I'm going to speak very briefly on a number of projects, especially those projects that centers on today's theme of equity and how we place vulnerable communities to data-driven solutions. Uh, first of all, uh, I guess I'm just given 10 minutes. That, that's what the agenda had said, right, Darren? Yeah, 10 to 15 minutes would be perfect. Okay, so I will speak on brief on the projects. I will share my insights and then I will leave on the chat um, links to our website, which has reports and the work that we are doing. Is that right, Darin? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Um, firstly, I would start with the, we have uh, the digital safety. The digital safety is a game that has been developed by policy with the aim of giving an opportunity for individuals, especially women, with possible solutions on how they can face and tackle threats when using the internet. The digital safety uh, is derived from safety, uh, the abbreviation for safe, and then digital, how we access the tools, how we access the current internet world, and T as a forum, like a, a, a very more of a, of a simple thing and a comfortable thing for anyone using this. The digital safety gives uh, individuals with personas of Goitse, Aisha, and Dami, all experiencing different scenarios of threats online. So when a person is using the game, uh, a person is exposed with possible solutions. What, how would they solve a certain threat when they experience that threat online? And then at the end, the game provides them with real life solutions because the threats are, are really threats that happen to them online. Uh, with the digital safety game, we hope that more women when using the game are able to have skills on how they can face internet threats and how they can solve them. We also uh, launched uh, the Amplified Abuse Report for the Ugandan uh, 2021 election. The Amplified Abuse Report uh, was a research conducted in Uganda by monitoring the activities of different politicians, both men and women. The report aimed at seeing really how do politicians engage with the social media platforms and what are their live the experiences from social media. So the research uh, monitored social media accounts of politicians who are men and women. And one of the results that we can say is we came to realize that 18% of women politicians were experiencing online abuse compared to 8% of men experiencing online abuse. So here we can all see the way especially African women are a threat when using the internet in a current world where the internet growth is growing from day to day. We also have another research we have done called the alternate realities, alternate internet, um, a feminist research for the feminist internet. This was more of a cross-sectional study that was done in five uh, African countries, that is uh, Kenya, Uganda, Senegal, uh, South Africa, and Nigeria. So I'll share a few insights from this report because with this, uh, with this report or this study, the aim was to learn how African women experience when it comes to internet usage and how do they tackle online abuse 
if at all they experience online abuse. So to say, one of the uh, results that we came through is that it is real online abuse exists, especially for women, because 28% uh, of women who were interviewed in this study admitted to have experienced a form of online abuse. But then with this study, we came to realize that more women are dropping from using digital tools or to say digital platforms such as social medias, because 12.2% of women admitted to really leaving the internet when they experience abuse because they do not know what the solution could be after experiencing abuse. So if this 12.2% are dropping, and this is just from five countries, what, what if this cross-sectional study was done globally? We would have seen or realized that more women are dropping out from the yeah. internet. But then we have, with the current um, growth of internet, more digitalized world, there is more chances, especially for women to experience mental challenges. From this 12.2, I mean, from this 28% who, are, uh, who admitted to have experienced the online abuse, 54% of them admitted to have experienced the, a form of mental challenge depression, anxiety, and fear when using the internet. So to say my call would be, so uh, as much as we have the internet, uh, as much as we have the internet growth, we are also at threat of losing more women with mental challenge issues such, such as anxiety, stress, and depression. Uh, but again, we really have a widening digital gender gap. As I said earlier, more women were leaving the internet as a result of online abuse. So for these women to drop from internet, we are still widening the digital gender gap that we have. So I really think that with the theme that we have on table, then we have to really consider on how safe can we make the internet and the global world for women to be involved in, especially to decisions that we are making at different angles and at different industries when it comes to vulnerable groups. Again, with uh, POLIS, we have the assistive ICT for persons with, the, with disability project. It was uh, more of a project and a research that aimed on how to, uh, to provide recommendations for the government and other stakeholders, especially when it, when it comes to persons living with disabilities to inform them that uh, this group of people having disability does not mean that they are disqualified. So the project aimed at how can we best improve uh, technology by providing assistive ICTs and technology for people living with disability. Uh, to top it all up, police has also been working around uh, women and artificial intelligence. Seems like Navina is not with us anymore. Um, no. Yeah. Maybe let's wait one minute just to see if she comes back because I don't want to start a Tracy's presentation um, if Navina is back. Okay, so I guess Tracy uh, will start your presentation now and we'll come back to Navina if she, she joins us later. Uh, so over to you and I think you have a presentation, uh, Mercedes, to, to share. Yeah.
You are uh, you are mute. Um. <laughs> Okay, so once again, a very good evening, a very good night. Um, and it seems like it's an East African affair over here. Navina is from Uganda, just next door, and I'm from Kenya. Um, so on behalf of the rest of the Open Heroines on call, on behalf of Mo, uh, Marie, uh, Marisa, Wakini, I'd like to thank you uh, for extending an invitation to us to participate um, in this session. And so I'll just give a brief of who we are as Open Heroines, because I'm sure there's very many people on this call who've never heard of Open Heroines. So I think you could just move to the next slide. So who are we as Open Heroines? We are an intersectional, we are an international and intersectional community of women and non-binary people working in the open fields, mainly open data, open tech, and open governance. And of course, when you talk about open government, we talk about governments that are accessible, accountable, and you know, share data on budgets and so on and so forth. Well, so that's us. Next. Next. Okay, so it's also very important uh, because we're talking about equity today. It's important to share that the core values of open heroines include inclusion and diversity. Um, we have an open communication policy. We like to collaborate like what we are doing here today. And of course, we are accountable. Um, next. And so in terms of um, equity, what has open data, uh, sorry, what has open heroines been doing to, to match, to push for equity in, in data? So in 2018, during the International Data Conference, we had a chance to do an open heroines gender spotlight event. And during this event, we did a duathon. And a duathon, like a hackathon, is a collaborative work sprint in which people come together to work on projects with an aim of coming up with certain solutions. So Open Heroines focused on open data projects centered on gender data. For next slide. So yes, so during the Duathon, Open Heroines focused on open data projects centered on gender data. For example, the Buenos Aires Gender Data Project and the Gender in Extractives Data Project. Um, later on, maybe Mo could share a little, a little bit more about those two projects. And so another thing that Open Heroines has been doing towards pushing for equity in data is for our community, um, for uh, for our community funds, we have been funding uh, local data events in different parts of the world, from Serbia to Tanzania to Sierra Leone. And the good thing about um, these local data events is that they uh, is, is that they covered a wide range of issues. Some covered air pollution, others covered uh, reproductive health rights others covered violence against women and so on and so forth. And that next slide. So that is a project in terms of, that was the project in Tanzania, that was a project in Sierra Leone, and the other one is a project in Lokoja in Nigeria. Next slide, please. And so coming up, um, we are partnering with ILDA uh, to give a few scholarships for the Data Against Femicide course, for which is going to be in Spanish, of course, for the Latin America uh, region. This course is important because um, femicide continues to be an issue that affects very many women in different parts of the world. In America, we have the case of Gabi Petito in Kenya. Recently, we had a case of a marathon runner, Agnes Tirop, at 25 years old, and she was just you know, she was just killed for no apparent, for no good reason. 
So it's important to, to be able to track femicide. And so we are happy to partner with ILDA to be able to sponsor a few people to take this course. Next slide. And of course, uh, as open heroines, we continue to push for, op uh, we continue to push that open government may be more inclusive uh, for women, for non-binary people, and for all other marginalized groups. Next slide. So other key uh, open heroine projects that push for equity include the open gender monologues, which are stories uh, of different people giving their experience, uh, how they experience the world from different parts of the world. Uh, for example, there was, a, there was a great monologue that was written by Marisa as they were doing their census tryout and the certain aspects that will not be covered, for example, by, by, by data, the personal stories like women, for example, having to work three jobs, having to, uh, to distribute care work and, and so on and so forth. And Open Heroines was able to take a very center stage at the Break the Rules campaign and also the feminist open government. And then we also did a guide for the guy who got stuck in a mano. In short, this is a guide to show you what to do in case you're faced by a mano um, in an effort to make sure that there is equity, that there is participation from different, uh, from different groups. And I will ask, um, my colleagues, Marisa and Mo, if they would like to add on to what I have said, they could take the floor. Okay. Sorry, I have, a, I have a child in the background. Uh, just to add to Tracy, here you can hear the child in the background. Uh, just to add to Tracy, that um, our communities also first and foremost try to um, promote openness. And there's a lot of people here who've been our allies for the year uh, can relate because even though we are promoting openness and equity, there's tons of work to do within to make sure that the organization, the organizations, government that participate, make sure the women has a place on the table. Um, but that's just what I wanted to emphasize. But other than that, Tracy covered all that. I did say we were inclusive, so. <laughs> Marisa, would you like to add anything? No, I think that you covered uh, almost everything. Just to tell uh, those who are here that uh, we are still accepting members to our community. So if you are interested, I can then paste the, the link of our, the form that you have to fill in in order to be part of, of our community. And then, um, on particularly, particularly on the project that uh, with the project that I joined the community was this uh, data, uh, the gender data indicators that uh, we built at the, the time that I was working at the city of Buenos Aires, leading the gender equality strategy. Um, it was really an, a, a, like a, a very, it was very important for me to be, to present that project within the IODC uh, conference that was organized in Buenos Aires and at the activity organized by Open Caring. By sharing our challenges at that time, by, um, by, by putting in common the work that we were planning to do at that stage and, uh, and have the feedback from uh, people, from women and, and, and other uh, non-binary people from uh, the Czech Republic, from, uh, from, I don't remember exactly which countries in Africa and others in, in Eastern Europe, some other colleagues from, from Latin America, we received uh, many interesting ideas uh, not only in how to build the indicators and how to put this uh, system that was later very successful, but also in how to make this data more available for, 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 for users uh, to, to, to be able to understand the data, to use the data, and, and, to, and to use, uh, sorry for, for the redundancy, this data for advocacy for, uh, for other um, public policy uh, related issues. 
So uh, my own personal experience with open hearings has been uh, very, very constructive. And I encourage you all to, to, join, the to join the community because uh, it's growing and we see that uh, most of us who are part of the community are benefiting from it uh, every day. Right. One more person. Wakini, would you like to say anything? Okay, maybe she's not on the call. Okay, that's it. Um, I'm on the call. Hi, everybody. Um, it's so <laughs> glad to be here. Um, I think um, Tracy, Marista, and more have done a good job um, sharing what open hearings do, um, do. And I'm really excited to be here and to meet these new community. Thank you. Great. <laughs> so thank you, Tracy, Moore, Marissa, and Wakini for uh, sharing your perspective, our open hearings perspective. So Navina, uh, I see that you're back. Uh, so you're free to take the floor and maybe finish presenting your great examples from policy. Oh, thank you, Darren. Uh, I got disconnected. Apologies for everyone. I was uh, just on the winding up part. Rather, I would like to go into recommendations since I'm aware that uh, this implementation working group is going to put this into action. Uh, as for my end, I would say when it comes to equity and how we bring into place the vulnerable groups, especially into data-driven solutions, one, uh, we really have to, to make the tech language simple, clear, and accessible. Because when we speak of data, we cannot, we cannot speak of data and technology or the tech industry leaving one aside. They both work uh, interchangeably. So with the digital platforms, the digital tools, with the really all innovations coming into our current digital world, we need everyone to be able to access products, services, knowledge, and everything that we are working around data, especially the vulnerable groups, speaking specifically of women, because uh, police work at a feminist angle. So we have to make sure that what we are working on really reflects the challenges that women are facing, especially considering that there are women living in uh, urban communities and there are also women living in rural communities. How do we bring data-driven solutions to accommodate both these diversities of women? There are also women who are more educated than others, but both have to survive at the current world. The current world that is growing with internet from time to time and the internet is no longer safe for women. There is trolling, body shaming, a slut calling, a lot of online abuses. So the internet is no longer safe. At the same time, our government's uh, national development plans and also the sustainable development goals all reflect at the digital economy, all aim at ensuring that our national economies are growing with the perspective that we cannot live behind the growth of technology. Uh, but then secondly, we have to acknowledge that online abuse exists. If we have to place women at, a, at, at an angle that they can access digital equal opportunities, same as men, we really have to speak it out that online abuse exists. And then how do we all bring efforts to ensure that this online abuse reduces or the art in the near future when we also come together like this, we no longer have a case of online abuse. I would say that um, it is time that we speak honestly that uh, online gender-based violence is real same as the offline violence. And then at some points, online violence is more harmful, especially right now that we are faced with the COVID-19 pa pandemic, women at workforces, women at working spaces are forced to use the internet or operately, operate remotely. So if the internet is not safe, I don't think if there's any decision that is going to be made and then women are placed at a really equal angle if they are not, if they are not having joint forces to speak for them. But then again, when it comes to the 
to, to data-driven uh, solutions, especially the digital angles in the tech industry. We have few number of women in the tech industry. The number is low. So if women are facing challenges, when it comes to addressing their We lost her again. Yeah, I think we did. Um, so I guess we can maybe, Marissa, you have I, yeah, yeah, no, I just, just want to add something that yeah. I, I, I work for Open Hearings as the community coordinator, but as I mentioned before, I was part of the leading team that coordinated the gender equality strategy at the city of Buenos Aires. And what she was mentioning, uh, it is a reality for like a kind of developed city as, as Buenos Aires, where internet penetration is, is pretty high. And, and it's interesting because one thing that uh, our mayor did in, in the past, he started to organize some uh, neighbors meetings, but only with women. And um, at these meetings, we learned as civil servants that uh, these situations of like sexual harassment uh, via internet was a main issue for, for many women in, in the city. And we were, uh, we were astonished about uh, the personal stories that these women were telling him uh, and, and, and shared with others in a pretty open uh, space. So uh, with that information in mind, we started to um, publicize a service that we already have that was like a kind of a hotline for women to denounce this, this uh, to report this sort of, uh, of harassment and to receive information on how to proceed with that. And at the end, what we did, because it, it was like a, a government and have the, the, the capacity to regulate on that, we passed a new law that uh, qualified this sexual online harassment as one of a, as a crime. And if you commit that, and uh, the, the woman, the woman or the person, because it's not only a uh, women, there are uh, like also young children, but mainly women who are victims of, of this uh, sort of a um, digital violence. You can report on that, and the per and if the person is found guilty, there is a, a, a very strong uh, punishment. So um, as as she was saying, like uh, it was important for us. I, I don't know if we were very successful, but uh, to communicate that this um, service is uh, is available, that you have the right to report on that, and you have the right to receive some support in order to overcome this uh, this 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 um, this um, violence that you are suffer from. But you have to that to do that in a simple, clear, clear, and accessible language. And there, I think that there is a lot of room uh, for improvement for governments and also for, for civil society members. And I think that this could be some, some issue to take as a conclusion for, for like a, for to, as a way forward to, to, to improve the work that both activists and, and policymakers are, are doing on that. And related to that, I, I also wanted to say that uh, in our community at Open Heroines, we, uh, we, we identify ourselves as a safe space, a safe place where you can also talk about these situations that not only affect uh, uh, women who, are, who do not have education or who have like more difficulties in accessing to some sort of resources, but that also affect very well educated women like those of us uh, sitting at this table today, who are suffering many times of this sort of, a, of, 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 of like difficult and unnecessary situations in our own work spaces. And at Open Heroines, we have a, we, we, we have a, a channel at, at Slack that specifically address uh, these issues and where uh, we were uh, surprised or not surprised to learn that this has been a uh, much more common than anybody have expected. And there have been women in the global north and in the global south suffering from these uh, situations. And with the community, we were able to uh, provide some sort of uh, support and, and strategies in order to uh, overcome uh, these uh, issues that are addressed by the law or by 
like public services differently in, in each country. Great, thank you, Marissa, for sharing all of that with us. Uh, I think I'll open the floor to any questions or if someone wants to share experience uh, from their country or their organization with the group, um, you're welcome to do so. So I just saw that Navina is back. Um, yeah, she's back. Navina, yeah. can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. I'm afraid I'm having internet challenges. No worries. Yeah, no worries. It's okay. Um, so Navina, is there anything else you wanted to share with the group and maybe you, you can keep your camera off, maybe it will, will help a little with the bandwidth? No, Darren, I don't have anything to, to okay. say. Great, thank you. Thank you, Marissa, for sharing the form for joining Open uh, Heron. Um, yes, Floor. Hey, I will try my best to, to talk. I don't know if you can hear me well. Yes. Uh, I'm in Awar right now. Um, just, I, I have a, a question to the whole panel and thank you so much for your presentations. Um, they have been inspiring and, and we have like, many ideas or, or, or ways to think on our implementation working group agenda for this year. Um, but I have a, a specific question regarding to what Naveen was saying about making um, open data or digital transformation accessible to different audiences. And in that sense, we always think that the whole solution will be like opening up more uh, data and like uh, asking governments to implement open data portals. And, and we sometimes, or we used to think that that was like maybe one of the solutions. I want to ask the rest of the group, um, if you know of any government experience, for example, Marisa what was uh, telling us about Buenos Aires, or maybe um, any national um, experience about uh, which other things we need um, to start using and to start opening up um, equity data or, equi or data that can help communities make their own decisions or like um, affect um, policies or, or, or social protection policies, for example, or policies related to caregiving or to transport. Um, so yeah, that's a, apart from opening up more data, which other things do you recommend? Um, thank you. I can talk or? Is that yeah, okay? of course. Yeah, sure. Um, so I think it's come with a couple of layers. So one is how do we make sure that people who are on the table actually understand what data is? And I don't like to say upskilling because I don't feel like we always like upskilling someone, but how do we make sure that we have like learning between communities and the data providers? And what does it mean? Like something that is really meaningful. So it's like uh, open with intent, right? So how do we making sure that they are involved in this, but they also understand what it is and then have the tools um, to use it later. It doesn't mean that everyone needs to be, to know Python, but it means that people need to know what are the possibilities that it can give them and how they can access it. So that's one. And second of all, yes, like I don't think that there's like, yes, there are specific data sets, but I think our mindset also needs to be, how is this data set if we open this data will harm women and or other intersections? Cause like it's not only women, but also how are we missing any data that by opening up people can be like uh, benefit from it, specifically minority groups, women, others. 
Um, Cause I think it's really important that when we say equity, we don't only think about gender, like gender is a whole, like there's other things connected to it, right? Um, so I can't say, yes, if you just open up all of the, all of the services that care services that are out there, women will feel better. It's, it's not only that, like there's all other stuff that is going into it. And also to add to the complexity, Data and language is complex. And I think um, I said this and I spoke about it on uh, one of the projects that um, Open Data Charter is doing around care, right? So also understand how the language of the stuff that we're opening is used by other people too. So it's not only what type of data, it's actually how the data is communicated and what to do because, and how people can access it from the other stuff. So it's like, like bottom up, uh, like bottom up and up bottom. So I know it's not really answered, like there's no really specific solution for, I'm sorry, but I think that there's our layers, just like intersectionality is different layers. And we need to, to think about all of these together. But if, if my vision for the future is that every time a data set is open, we're thinking about all of these and say, okay, we're not like, we pass this the time of like, let's put it out there. Activists will use it and create something good out of it. We're now in actually in a situation that we say, okay, how are we more st strategic about it? And how do we make sure that those people are at the table while opening the data sets, after that using it, getting feedback. Feedback is something that the whole open data community is really bad of. Because people are like, oh, people will give me feedback back when they're using the data. No, that's not how it happens. So yeah, not a good answer, but like I think it's just like, look at all of the data production and think where gender come in and in other intersectionalities where people are not there and what? Because that's where the power is, right? So like opening something without thinking of the intent doesn't change the power dynamic. Actually thinking of the intent of it does. That's from yeah, me. Makes me think that we would almost, almost need like a checklist, right? When we publish data sets uh, to see, to do kind of a gender-based analysis, as we say in Canada, to make sure that the data sets we open are usable but also maybe that we have consulted those communities because we it's good to open data but we need to make to make sure that the communities that are subject of that data are also comfortable with this data being out in a way especially for indigenous peoples in can in the can canadian context at least um i don't know i saw that paul raises his hand pa paul yeah yeah, hi, I was just having this random thought um, while people were speaking. <laughs> um, and part of it is, is, is actually um, where do you get the data from? And so the sort of only reliable sources you're seeing opened up are the sort of once every five year survey from a government agency or from the likes of yourselves trying to gather data. But, um, you know, the best data is from uh, from what actually happens. And so I was wondering whether it was worth sort of having advocating for the likes of social media platforms to start releasing statistics as open data as part of their, um, their, their contribution to a safe society. And I thought then, okay, but how much doesn't get, uh, how, how much don't people complain to the platforms, but then if the data was being made available, then eventually people might actually start complaining, even if it's just to knock up the numbers to reflect the reality. Um, yeah, just a thought. But it's a really valid point about um, being concerned about for the subject matter, you know, for the people in the data, what's going to be implications to them. Um, and just on a um, related but side note, um, during the pandemic, uh, one of the issues we had here in New Zealand was actually um, knowing who to help that really desperately, you know, the most vulnerable in our com community were actually those that didn't want to be known or discovered by the authorities. Um, they're living in our streets or hiding away um, you know, over stairs. But at the end of the day in the pandemic, government realized that, hey, these are still people wanted to reach out, but they didn't want to be reached out to. <laughs> um, so it's one of the, uh, that'd be really interesting to hear if people have any experience in that area or have any ideas around how to help people like that. That's me for now. Yeah, I, I think what you are mentioning, Paul, is also, well, I'm, I'm working now in an FAO project in Asia and the Pacific. Um, we are trying to work with farmers uh, generated data and we are facing and we are trying to unpack the word consent because we always like think that consent is something that we have in our um, data protection laws and regulations, which is good to have it and GDPR like 
uh, is like also like uh, making us think on on ways of asking consent. Uh, but we are trying to unpack this word and try to think how does consent or, or real consent um, implies to our communities and the communities that are generating data and are sharing data with government entities. For example, uh, working with vulnerable populations, things related to land governance is something that we think that it will like really bring benefits uh, or um, make livelihoods better, but uh, at the end of the day, if there are like disputes around uh, land governance, we are opening up data that will uh, create harms to those communities. So I think that consent is something that um, we will have to explore in the agenda during this year um, and how we can make communities accountable of the data they are generating and also make them use it and and like set up a, a data governance that can make them um, like that can make this data really use, useful and, and really like um, bring benefits. Carolina. Yes, hello, sorry. <laughs> I had my camera off. Um, I just wanted to react from Argentina. I'm together with the Open Data team. I'm in charge of the Open Government Agenda. It's nice to see you again. We have been off some months of these um, monthly meetings. But related to the gender agenda, I think that there's a challenge we have, which has to do with open data by uh, Women's Institute or, the, or the, in the case of Argentina, the the Ministry of Women. We have a challenge there because it's a kind of new institution. And so the data policy is not that uh, um, anchored in their, in their mission. But that doesn't mean that they are not doing anything to empower women, to protect women from gender violence. So I'm sharing this as a challenge we have, how to connect the open data community movement policy with a new line ministry which is focused on women. And what I've seen a lot is that many times like the, the gender and open data community gathers in a place, but the, the gender community or the, the women's movements are not part of the members of, the, of that conversation. So I think that maybe in the case of Argentina, we, we are trying to, to work on that challenge, especially taking into consideration that we are launching a strategic plan on open government and that this year we will be co-creating the Faith Action Plan. We've been trying for over two years to, to try to engage and start building the open data catalog of the Ministry of Women. But I think that there are interesting experiences which can bring some inspiration at least, not just to commitments, but, but why uh, gender data matters. Not just open data on gender, but gender data and this has to do with, with Paul mentioned regarding how the pandemic affected women and there's a lot of evidence collected in Argentina on how women were on the most vulnerable groups and those who had to be assisted by the states and by by specific uh, assistance programs were the most affected by the effects of isolation of not working so we don't have that data in open data formats so maybe that's a step move forward but in order to do that we need to create more demand on data. And so far, I haven't witnessed that demand on open data on gender that could help an office like the Open Data Office in Argentina, like the Open Government Office in Argentina, to really make sure that this is not just a claim of the open data team, okay? Build a catalog, publish your open data, but this is a, a general claim. So I think that we have a challenge there. And I think that there are ex other experiences, for instance, in Mexico of, on commitments on uh, gender, on the care policy, uh, which have been showcased. They are featured as part of the OGP Leaders Network. There has recently been a, a podcast uh, sharing the experience of how Women's Institute can, can also work jointly with civil society and collaborate. So maybe there is not, not so many examples on open, working jointly on open data, but yes, on OPE working jointly to foster more access to information, access to social care, access to, to rights and to combat uh, gender violence. But there's a, those are some, some reflections like to, and of course we are very welcome on, on ideas, especially regarding our fifth action plan on how to approach 
and an, an institute of, of women, a ministry of women to advance more open data. Thanks. So we tried to do that in Canada, but we realized that our uh, women and gender equality department, so they use the segregated data, but they don't fully understand the concept of open data. So there's like a lot of education to do even in the government between departments and agencies. Um, but yeah, we could have a conversation on that, uh, Carolina, if you're interested, uh, but it's also a challenge here in Canada. Um, so I'm opening, yeah, is, is there any other question? Uh, we still have nine minutes. Um, or if anyone wants to share uh, some perspectives or experience or thoughts uh, on equity and data. Going once, going twice. Adia? Uh, you're saying that even CSOs, gender experts, have little knowledge about open data. Yes, so maybe everyone should be working more on open data literacy to try to make those linkages more obvious. Uh, so there's a lot of work for everyone in the government and civil society, I guess. <laughs> um, okay, so... Uh, thank you a lot to Open Herons and to uh, Policy uh, for sharing with us your great experiences um, today. So uh, we will be writing a blog on today's conversation uh, and we will be uh, publishing it on the uh, Open Data website. And we'll also send a link because we re recorded the session. So we'll send that as a follow-up email. Uh, we also wanted to conclude by saying that uh, in February, we will be dedicating uh, our implementation working group to a brainstorm around the uh, 2022 action plan of the group. Uh, so our goal really will be to maximize the uh, impact and the usefulness of our meetings. And we really want to hear your thoughts about what would be the most interesting topics to explore in 2022 that would be important for your work on the ground, but also for the open government, uh, uh, sorry, open data global agenda. So we would have homework for all of you. Uh, one, we would really appreciate if you could take some time to answer the survey that we sent uh, two weeks ago. So maybe Mercedes, you can add the link to the survey in the chat and we'll also try to send it uh, as in a follow-up email. And uh, if you can come prepared with ideas in February so we can have a, a meaningful uh, discussion about the action plan for 2022. Uh, and in the meantime, uh, feel free to reach to the ODC Secretariat, to Flor or myself if you have any questions about uh, the, the working group or if you have ideas or if you want to, to present something. Uh, and yeah, so thank you a lot for participating today and we will see you in February. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye bye. bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Nice to see Thank you. you. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye.